So, just what is monsters? Not what are monsters, even though technically that's a loaded question, but we all know what monsters are. But what is this show called Monsters? Our favorite show. Well, it's about a 50s era family of monsters. Honey, it's family hour. There must be something on. Who sit down every week to watch their favorite show. Oh, wow, candy critters. Okay, not really, but that is the opening sequence. Mom and daughter are horned cyclopses and dad looks like a potato with an arm that looks like a root. Oh my God, he's a literal couch potato. Good one, creators. Anyway, it's a lot of fun and I insist on never skipping it whenever I watch an episode. It really sets the tone. What the show actually is, is a half-hour horror anthology that takes the monster of the week trope literally. Every episode is a standalone story that revolves around some kind of monster, usually literal but sometimes metaphorical. It was shown in the same block as Friday the 13th the series and Freddy's Nightmares. Monsters is one of those unique shows that manages to be pretty clever and intriguing, despite having pretty low production values. That's probably due at least in part to it sharing a producer with the better known Tales from the Dark Side, Richard P. Rubenstein. Also, Dick Smith being in charge of makeup effects didn't hurt. In fact, a lot of these stories are either based on a story or written by a well-known horror author. And you're probably gonna see a lot of actors you recognize as well from either before or after they became well-known. I will do my best to point out all of this stuff when it happens. I will admit though that the first few episodes are kind of hit or miss, so at least in the beginning, I may end up doubling up and covering two episodes in one video, at least until the show picks up. So bust out your candied critters and watch monsters with me. It's starting. The pilot is called The Fever Man which opens with a father, Mason, bringing his sick daughter to be treated by someone who may or may not be a charlatan. But I saw the look in my wife's face before she died. Now I see the same look in my daughter's face. She's all I have left. And you can't save her, can you? The fact that he has to pay for it before even being let in isn't a good sign. The girl's doctor has come along, who is named James. Hmm, James Mason? That probably wasn't intentional. Anyway, he's the skeptical one, because of course one of them has to be skeptical. You seem to be quite an expert. My grandfather used to tell me about the Feverman. Apparently the Feverman are a local legend who are known for being able to bring out the sickness and fight it somehow. He's got the crystal. He can call the sickness out. Yeah, that does sound kind of wacky, doesn't it? You genuinely believe that? Well, why shouldn't he? Also, I don't know if I'd trust this guy alone with my kid. So this is the fever man, whose last name is Boyle. Now that's gotta be intentional. <laughs> that's a right nasty one, isn't it? And again, James isn't a fan. You are one of the most despicable things I have ever set eyes on. You must be quite a keen observer, Doctor. Most people get to know me quite a bit before they reach that conclusion. So Mason is told to take the kid into this room that's behind a locking gate. Yikes, this room is like a dungeon. Would you like a drink, Doctor? The finest whiskey available. And if you haven't noticed yet, Boyle drinks pretty heavily. No, thank you. He's like, great, now what am I going to do with the second one? In any case, Boyle explains why he charges so much. I'm a proud man. And the people that make use of my services, they're proud. And when you're proud, gratitude can be a terrible burden. When they pay my prices for a life, there's no need to be grateful. I'm grateful to no one, and no one's grateful to me. That's pretty interesting. So poor Mason tries to hurry him up because like his kid's dying and I love Boyle's reaction. You fellas are dressed most elegantly and you talk all elegant, but your manners leave a great deal to be desired. I'm having a conversation here and you're interrupting. And that is very rude, Timothy. He's just like, oh uh, gee, maybe I better do what he says. Whenever you're ready. There really is an interesting three character dynamic going on. We've got the desperate father. I believe in it because I have to, because it's my daughter's only hope. My only hope. And of course the doctor and the fever man who are at odds with each other. Both of them come across like assholes, but it's just because they each feel so strongly about their own methods. I just want the simple respect that every working man craves. Ah, oh, fuck it, just drink both glasses. So does he give the money back if the patient dies? But it turns out that's not really an issue for him. My cure has to work. 
Because the first time I fail, it will surely be my last. If I don't kill the bloody thing, it'll take us both. So Boyle has them leave so he can do his thing. Looks like he's not a charlatan after all, because he's definitely doing something. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other two guys hear screams from the other side of the door, and James insists on going in. I'm sorry, I can't let this go on. No! If you open that door, you'll kill them both! Is that what you're afraid of? Or of seeing the truth? I guess the door wasn't locked after all. And here's what they walk in on. This is how Fever Man fights the illness. He causes it to take a physical form, which he then kills. Unfortunately, they've distracted him and the monster wins. Notice that Boyle takes off the crystal on a chain that he was wearing. Oof, he wasn't kidding when he said it was a nasty one. Anyway, now it's back inside the girl. Catherine! Burke, I swear to you, if my daughter dies... I didn't say there wasn't any hope, Mr. Mason. Feverman sends the dad away, but asks James to stay so he can have a word with him. Let's speak plainly, one man to another. Since it's James's fault that things went sour, he needs to be the one to fix it since Boyle is too injured. Me? Fight that thing? That horror? It's all very well to devote your life to healing, <laughs> but it all appears in a different light when you have to put your life on the line, doesn't it? If I don't, she'll die. Yes, I suppose I owe it to you. Boyle has him put the chain around his neck. Yeah, have a drink. No, I don't. Take it. It'll calm you down and maybe it'll loosen you up a bit. Yeah, he's gonna need that drink. We're suddenly beginning to understand Boyle now. Fevers are big and strong, but they're stupid and awkward. They know how to attack, but they're no good at defending themselves, remember that. Anyway, he tells James what to do and gives him some last minute advice. Touch her between the eyes. <laughs> And the monster's back. Come on, Doctor. Dodges punch, then counterpunch. <coughs> Join the Nintendo Fun Club today, James. It's a pretty brutal fight. James manages to put out one of its eyes. You gotta, you gotta it down. And eventually snaps its neck. Go, James. That wasn't so bad, was it? Daddy! Oh, thank God. Thank God! Well, it turns out that this was not a one-time thing. Race, race for me. I... I think not. The fever man is cursed, and Boyle has just passed that curse on to that. James. And he can't just choose not to do it. The trouble is, each time you don't use it, you sort of... you sort of fade away. Another customer! Good luck, James. You just get this down. And I'll handle the rest. I always have. I always have. Seems like the lady is similarly cursed. Requiesco in pace. And so ends the fever man. This isn't the best Monsters episode, but it's definitely a good one and a good example of what this show does well. The monster designs are usually interesting and the effects with them are pretty good, for a show like this anyway, but it's the stories and character interaction that really make it something special. This story in particular is fairly simple, but it plays out in an interesting way. I like how our first glimpse at the Fever Man himself shows him as a sloppy drunk with a jerkish attitude. Then in the end, you find out why he's that way. Life sucks for him because he is cursed in such a way that he's forced to put his life on the line constantly until he mercifully dies. Only then is he able to get a break, but then he has to pass it on to someone else. Considering this is a half hour episode and they probably didn't want to stuff it with too much exposition, they don't cover every possibility, like why can't he just kill himself, for example. But the nature of a curse is that you just can't get out of it that easily. Let's just assume that stuff like that is covered. In any case, the monster is neat. Definitely gross looking and a good way to symbolize sickness. In fact, it kind of reminds me of the insane cancer in Silent Hill 3, which also partly symbolizes sickness. Too bad this guy didn't deflate when he died. 
but the actors do a great job, and this story seems to be more about the people than the monster. The character interaction is great. The Fever Man himself was played by David McCallum, who is apparently well known, but I'm not personally familiar with him. Apparently he ended up playing one of the main characters on NCIS. It was also directed by Michael Gornick, who also directed Creepshow 2 and was the cinematographer for the first Creepshow and Dawn of the Dead. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first episode of my Monsters Retrospective. Even if you've never heard of this show, I hope you stick around to hear more about it. Next up is Holly's House. See you then. give back the money when your patients die. No? How despicable. <laughs>